It's 6.30, so we're going to go ahead and start. My parents pastor a little Pentecostal church, and they would always wait for a crowd to come in before they would start. And this little man told my mom one time, you start on time out of respect for those who are here on time. So it is 6.30, and we're starting. Uh, welcome tonight to the Property Tax Town Hall provided by the Williamson County Appraisal District, Williamson County Tax Office. Those of you who I do not know, I'm Larry Gonzalez. I had the honor and privilege of serving as state representative for House District 52 out of Brown Rock, Hutto, Taylor, and parts of Georgetown for, uh, it seemed like forever, but it was only eight years. Uh, I will be moderating tonight's discussion for you guys. Thank you to Georgetown ISD uh, for letting us use this incredible facility. The purpose of tonight's town hall will be a general overview of the property tax system in our state. Because we fund local government the way we do, it places an emphasis on the property tax. So tonight, we're here to help you understand generally the big picture of how this process works. Now, I'm going to add a little comment to my written notes here. I think it's important that everybody understands exactly what your variables are when you go into this system. It is complicated, and there are lots of questions, and unfortunately, thank you social media, there's a lot of uh, bad information out there. It's amazing the number of questions and comments you get because someone heard something or somebody read something that wasn't accurate. So tonight we're going to be here to help you understand uh, the big picture. The presentations and the Q&A of the presenters will last about an hour tonight. Uh, but afterwards, we do have some folks here from the tax office in the Prairie District who will stay a little bit longer to answer your individual questions. I want to introduce you to the presenters um, tonight. The actual bios I was told are in the, in the information. So we're going to skip the resume reading and just get straight to the conversation. Alan Lankford is the chief appraiser at Williamson County Central Appraisal District, and he is going to speak about the appraisal process. Larry Gaddis is our Williamson County Tax Assessor Collector, and he will speak about the tax rates. And Steve West, who is a former CFO for Georgetown ISD, will speak about school funding. I will speak a little bit after that, and when they're done about the legislature and where they are right now, and what that looks like with the number one issue pressing that body, which is property tax reform. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alvin, and I'm going to let him start his presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me OK in the back? All right. Well, thank you for coming. The turnout actually amazed me. I, we were taking bets on whether it would be 20 people that would show up, or we'd have a full house. And I think we landed on full house. So uh, glad y'all are here tonight. Um, this idea came about at a board meeting we had a few, uh, few months, maybe even a year ago now, and uh, really to be transparent to you as property owners on this whole process that we have as property tax in our state. So with that, I get to start you off on the simple property tax equation we have in our state. We'll get into a little bit more elaborate detail in a few minutes, but the equation is taxable value times the tax rate equals the property taxes that you will pay. Sounds very simple, right? Let's talk about who is responsible for each of those. So the first one, the value, that's the responsibility of our office, the appraisal district. We place values on your property for tax purposes. The next one, the tax rate, is the responsibility of the individual tax units. So this is your cities, your county, your schools. They formulate the tax rate. The reason they formulate that tax rate is they have a budget. They have monies that they need to provide you with the services. The more interesting portion of this, I believe, is when do this do these things happen? The values that we place on your properties are as of January 1st each year, but they're placed on your property at the time we send that appraisal notice out, that personal invitation we send to everybody in here, right? You all received that a few weeks ago from our office. So during that time, we have no idea what the end result in taxes will be. All we know is what's going on in the market as far as sales transactions. That doesn't occur till later. The taxes do not occur till later. So remember, this is happening at the beginning of the year. If I choose a number at the beginning of the year that is then multiplied by another number late in the year, who is determining the outcome of that equation? 
the taxing units that are formulating those tax rates that are budgeting for those services are those that form, uh, form the amount of tax that will be paid. So let's think about this. If we have an increase in values of a certain percent, let's say 5%, if you do not have a corresponding decrease in the tax rate of the same percentage, what has happened? You've seen an increase in taxes because if they don't increase the tax rate of the same percentage, they're collecting more taxes than they did the prior year. I'm not saying those taxes aren't justified. They provide good services to our, our county, to our schools, to our teachers, to the roads. Everything that they do for us as a community is based on that tax rate in their budget. But who determines the amount of tax paid is not the appraisal district. But unfortunately, we've had an imbalance in our system within the state of Texas uh, for many, many years. Uh, last year, we had 57,000 protests that form, come through our office at the appraisal district. If you think about how many people actually showed up for the tax rate hearings at most of the uh, taxing units, I hear varying numbers, but it's usually between zero and two people. Okay, so which part of the equation are people taking uh, advantage of? It's only the appraised value. So I'm here to encourage participation in the entire process. We're in a democracy. That's what this is supposed to be about. You're supposed to participate in the process. You're doing that tonight. I encourage you to have that same level of participation when that second number is chosen as well. Those property taxes, the bills go out uh, in the October time frame, they're due upon receipt. So that is our responsibility as taxpayers. We pay those bills after that point. So let's talk about market value. Market value is what we place on your property. There is no limitation on market value. I see this all the time on social media, hear it from conversations from individuals. Isn't my value only supposed to go up by 10%? That is not the market value. The market value is representing what the property would sell for on January 1st of the year. And so we're using comparable sales to get there. However, the assessed value, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, is the one that is capped at that 10% increase. Now remember, we're at 100% of market value. We have to be there, not because we want to be, because I get to see 57,000 of you uh, come into our office. That's a huge disincentive to get there. We're, we're there because the comptroller's office, by state mandate, comes in and actually audits the appraisal district for those values. If we do not achieve a full market value on those properties, guess what? They removed state funding from our schools. And so it is our responsibility as an appraisal district to get to that value because we're going to be audited. And if we lose state funding for our schools, you lose teachers for your kids. Not only that, if you don't lose teachers, then who is going to make up that difference? The local tax base, not the state. And so keep in mind, those values are increasing because we're following sales, but not because we want to increase. It's because of where we're at. Let's talk about that market value form formulation. We're utilizing sales in your neighborhood. So the picture you're seeing above you here, or above me here, is the uh, a map of a particular neighborhood in Williamson County. As you can see, it's highlighted, and you can tell on the monitor, in kind of a blue color. So that's the area where we're pulling sales from. The sales are indicated by the dollar signs that you see up there. And so we utilize those sales. We take a look at where our values are when it comes to the cost it would take to replace that home, lessening depreciation for its age, and then we use a multiplier effect that we would increase or decrease, if it may, uh, the value of those properties to get to those sale prices. That's how we get there. Again, we're audited by the state to make sure we do. Next is the assessed value. I mentioned this a while ago. This is the one where you actually have a cap on the amount of increase you see. So 10%, if you have a homestead, which means it's your primary residence and you've applied for a homestead at our office, is the most the assessed value can go up from one year to the next. Very simple math. You had a $100,000 home last year, Appraisal district says it's worth 115,000 this year. The most you're going to have in assessed value, 110,000, right? So you're only gonna go up at 10%. The next part of that equation is taxable value. This was the value I talked about that you multiply times the tax rate. So remember, we started with market value. We have assessed value, which is capped at 10%. Then you take off any applicable exemptions to your property. So if you have a homestead, for instance, $25,000 is removed from your assessed value before it's multiplied times that tax rate to get, to get your taxes. 
So those are the three terms that are actually in the pamphlet we handed you when you walked in today. So if you ever want to go back and look at them, you'll be able to see them there. Next, we have a simple version of the property tax calendar. We'll go over a lot of detail here, but the first part of it is about July through January of every year. Our appraisers are in the field. We're measuring new homes. We measured over 7,500 new homes this year in Williamson County. They are checking existing properties for changes that we've received permits on. They're out there gathering information for that valuation. That valuation time frame begins in the December, January time frame when they come in. They take a look at the uh, information they've collected and start placing values on that home as to what it would sell for on January 1. We send notices out on April 2nd, not April 1st. I'll give you one reason for that. <laughs> They're not an April Fool's joke, right? So we're sending them out to you on April 2nd. You receive them shortly thereafter. Keep in mind on your notice, you're going to see that there is a time frame that you can walk into our office without an appointment. So that appointment is not necessary. Just come in and see us if you have a concern about your value. Um, after that point, there is a deadline for protesting your property value as of May 15th. And at that time, we'll start scheduling hearings for you to come into our office at a specific date and time. And that date and time, you'll actually be able to come in again, speak with an appraiser. If you can't agree with that appraiser, you can move on then to the appraiser review board who will determine your value. And about July, once we're done with most of those protests, we turn that value over to the taxing units to then formulate that tax rate I talked about a few minutes ago. So they look at their value, they look at the, their budget, and they figure out what that tax rate needs to be to be able to fund that budget. Then we turn them, they turn it over to Larry's office and he gets to send you the bills. <laughs> <laughs> so when you come in on a market value protest, this is what you're going to see. It's a sales comparison grid on the very, very quickly, it's on the very far left is your property. To the right is the sales that we're utilizing on your valuation. We're going to adjust for differences. The easiest adjustment I can think of is a pool. Let's say one of those comparable sales had a pool and you don't. We'd want to take the value of that pool out of that sale price before we compare it to your property. Does that make sense? We want to make those adjustments. Then we come down to a value that we give you at that point. You can make a determination <coughs> if you agree or not agree. If you don't agree, then you can go to the appraiser review board and pick your case to them as well. Appraiser review board is a group of citizens that actually hear those hearings. Listen to your case, listen to our case, make a decision. The other popular method is equal and uniform. Uh, and that means you feel that your value is higher than other properties that are like yours in your, in your neighborhood. So in that case, you see something very similar as what you see here, except you're starting with appraised values and not sales and making those same adjustments and coming to a value. We try to give you information. We'll show exactly where those sales or those equal and uniform comparables are being pulled from. As you can see, they're right around the subject property that's highlighted in the red. They're going to be in that neighborhood, preferably. Uh, but th this is what you'll see when you actually come in for a value protest. Next, we have the WCAD mar market data. This is on WCAD.org. This is our website. Uh, this is one of the new features we've had in the last year. What this is, is if you go on your property, search your property, at the very top, there's gonna to be a little red house icon. Click that, and what you'll get is some statistics that you're gonna see on the bottom left here. I know you probably can't read that from the audience, but kind of give you an idea of what's there. Details of your property, details of all the properties that are in your neighborhood, so the average square foot, the range of square footage, the average uh, value, range in values, and then it gets into the average sales what the average sale price was, the range of those sales, how many sales we had in your neighborhood. That's interesting information, but I think the more interesting information is where they're located. So if you click that big red button at the bottom there, it takes you to a map of those sales. You recognize that map a while ago of the same neighborhood we've been looking at. Dollar signs are the sales that we use in your neighborhood to value all the properties there. Click on one of those dollar signs and it gives you details about that property. Can't give you the sale, unfortunately. There is some restrictions in the tax code that do not allow us to do so, but we give you a lot of information about that sale. You'll have the quality of the property, you'll have the age, the size, and then guess what? Google is amazing. Put that address into Google, and a lot of times you'll come back with the sale price because there's information out there associated with it on the web. Or you call your local realtor, they'll give you that information as well. I encourage you to do this before you file your protest, only because most people, because Texas is a non-sale disclosure state where not everybody knows what you paid, so you really don't know what the market is doing in your area, this is a way for you to find out. 
you can actually go out there and look and try to determine whether or not that appraised price that we put on your home is right. I would highly encourage you to do this instead of come in and then you're forced to uh, spend your time to see that the market value we may have placed on your property was exactly right. Uh, so this gives you an opportunity to do that ahead of time. You can also file a protest online and get the exact same information through a sales comparison that we'll give you on, on an email. Last slide I have today is our videos. We are the first appraisal district in the state to put out videos such as this. If you go on our website on the bottom right hand corner, you're going to see a videos area. <coughs> Click that and it'll, it'll give you a list of videos that go through how we appraise properties, kind of what I was just telling you, what the protest is like. I was, you know, I spoke to many property owners throughout the years and they were really intimidated by the process until they actually went through it. This will give you an idea of what that looks like. We'll also talk about how we measure your property. So there's a lot of information out there that I believe will help you through this process of understanding what it is we do at the appraisal. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and I'm actually going to turn it over to Larry Gass now to talk about his portion of this. I don't think I need to tell anybody exactly what the tax assessor collector does. I think we're all pretty familiar with that. But uh, there are two things on this slide. The, the top two bullet points uh, are things that we do in our office that most people have no clue is happening uh, in, during the tax year. And that is calculating truth and taxation rates and publishing notices on behalf of the taxing units. So my office gets information from the appraisal district and we get some information from the taxing units and again the taxing units are the, the county school districts cities esds muds uh, their special districts acc the junior college district so when we say districts or taxing units all of those are the are the uh, taxing jurisdictions in williamson county and there are 105 of them that tax our properties throughout the county but those are the tax units that we're talking about when we when we go through this so we calculate truth and taxation rates that is the effective rate and the rollback rate if you've heard of them they've been discussed thoroughly uh, in the discussions with legislation uh, this session and the effective rate is the rate that a taxing unit would adopt to get the same revenue this year that they got last year. So if they adopt the effective rate, that means that they're not raising taxes because they're getting the same revenue this year that they got last year. So what happens is if values, and this is just speaking in general terms, if values in that taxing unit go up about 6%, you, that taxing unit should be able to adopt a tax rate that's about 6% lower and get the same amount of revenue that they got the previous year. Does that make sense? So if a taxing unit adopts a rate that is higher than the effective rate, they are effectively raising taxes because they're getting more revenue from the properties in that jurisdiction than they got the previous year. We also calculate the rollback rate in my office. That rate is the, that's the infamous rate in, in Senate Bill and House Bill 2 that allows taxing units to get about 8% more revenue for maintenance and operations taxes than they got in the previous year before they hit a trigger to where you could possibly vote to lower that rate. So if they adopt a rate that's higher than the rollback rate, then there's a potential that you could petition to have that rate be put on a ballot and the voters decide whether that rate needs to be lowered down to the rollback rate or not. Those are just two rates that we calculate. They're called, it's called truth and taxation process. We do that through the months of August, typically. And then we publish notices on behalf of the taxing units. Everybody gets a newspaper here, right? No? Okay. Uh, well, for some reason, the legislature thinks that it is appropriate to put a tax rate adoption meeting and, and hearing notices in the newspaper to inform citizens about what the effective and rollback rates are for taxing jurisdictions and when those taxing jurisdictions are going to have their public hearings and their meetings to adopt the tax rate. My office publishes, we calculate the rates, we gather some information from the taxing units and we put those notices in the newspapers, typically um, in the local papers in the Williamson County, the Wilco Sun, uh, there's a few of those notices that go in the Austin American Statesman. It's very expensive to put those notices in there, but we do a few of those. And then the Hill Country um, Taylor Daily Press, the Hill Country um, uh, paper out in Liberty Hill. So you'll find notices typically in the month of August 
in those newspapers, letting you, the taxpayers, know when those taxing jurisdictions, the rate that they're proposing, their effective in rollback rates, and the meetings, the dates of, and times of the meetings of when they're going to be adopting those tax rates. So those are two things in my office that we're doing typically in the month of late July throughout the month of August and early September that most people don't know that we're working on. Uh, the calculating rates and publishing notices. The one thing everybody knows we do is calculate and mail the tax bills. Uh, I like to say that I do math. I take the value from the appraisal district and the rates from the taxing units and do the math on those. There's an equal sign there, and then there's a big number with a dollar sign in front of it on the other side, right? Uh, I, that's the, the tax bill that we send out. We collect those, uh, those funds and disperse them back to the tax units. So this is the point in the program where I get to say, I do not keep any of your money. I have to <laughs> give it all away. Um, so I collect on behalf of the 105 taxing units in the county, take in all that money, and it's approximately uh, $1.4 billion for everybody. And I take that money and then I give it back to everybody that levied that tax rate. Again, that's the, the schools and the cities and the county and MUDs and ESDs. So bills go out. Our office, we, we set a goal to get the bills out in hopefully around the middle of October, about October 15th. Taxes are actually due upon receipt of that bill. So most people think that taxes are due on January 31st. They're actually due upon receipt of the bill. They are delinquent if not paid by January 31st. So if we receive your payment on February 1st uh, or your envelope is postmarked February 1st, you will unfortunately incur 7% penalties and interest per the property tax code if that payment is late. So I encourage everybody, let me make a statement right now, Please, please, please do not wait until the very last day to drop your envelope in the mailbox. The post office has no guarantee that they're gonna put a postmark of that day on that envelope. And unfortunately, we have to have some very difficult conversations with folks who put their envelope, their payment in the mailbox on January 31st and the postmark, postmark uh, the post office postmarked their payment February 1st and they incurred 7% penalties and interest. So, just a public announcement there, please don't wait until the last day to, to mail your property tax payments. So probably the most important things I wanna hear, how can you lower your tax bill? There's three things that I typically talk about to groups about what you can do to lower your property tax bill. The first thing, Alvin's already discussed it, and that is protest your value if you have evidence that shows that it should be lower. And, and you talk about what that evidence is, sales in a neighborhood, and you've got a map there that shows folks uh, what sales you use to determine their value. But if you have evidence to show that it, be low, it should be lower, by all means, please protest your value with the appraisal district. Apply for the appropriate exemptions. There's four major exemptions that you might be eligible for, and I'm gonna go into those in detail here in just a second. But uh, make sure that you apply for and uh, have received the appropriate exemptions on your property. Uh, specifically your residents, and then attend budget and tax rate hearings. And this is probably the most difficult part of the thing that you can do. It's the most time consuming, but it is the most important piece that you can do to have an impact on your tax bill. Alvin mentioned earlier, uh, I, I was witness to the county commissioner's court when they adopted their tax rate. You said you had 57,000 properties that were protested uh, in Williamson County last year out of about 230,000, right? So 57,000 out of 230 were protested for their value. I was at the Williamson County Commissioner's Court where two people out of 600,000 residents in Williamson County, two people stepped up to the podium and said, Commissioner's Court, please lower my taxes. And they didn't give any solutions or any, offer any uh, solutions as to what they were willing to do without or what the Commissioner's Court should cut from their budget in order for those taxes to be lowered. This is the part that I hear from school board trustees, I hear it from city council members, I hear it from commissioners court. We wish we would hear from taxpayers about what they're willing to do without. Because typically what they hear is we want better schools, better roads, more teachers, and, and so on and so forth, and that stuff kind of costs money. And uh, so we've got to present solutions to the governing bodies of our taxing units if we want to see our tax tax uh, bills 
go down instead of up. Attending budget and tax rate here, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail on that in just a second. I do want to uh, touch on your exemptions. So find your property either on my website or Alvin's and look up your specific property uh, and make sure that you, if you have a, if you live on that property and you have a homestead exemption, that homestead exemption is going to save you typically based on where you live, anywhere between $300 to $350, okay? If you have a 65 or over exemption on your property, that's gonna save you an additional, an additional $150 to about $500, and it varies greatly because there are some taxing units that give exemptions to over 65, and there are some that don't. So it, de it, it really depends on where your property is. Uh, it's going to determine the benefit that you receive from any of these exemptions. It can range anywhere between $150 to $500. A disabled person's exemption can save you anywhere between $150 to $500, again, depending on where you live. And if you're a disabled veteran, you also can get an exemption based on the level of your disability. That saves you anywhere between $100 and $200, and sometimes up to $300 if you have a disabled veteran's exemption. Now, these exemptions, specifically the homestead, uh, the savings for the 65 or disabled get added to your homestead exemption. So you can save anywhere between 600 to maybe in some cases up to $1,000 if you have a homestead exemption and a 65 or disabled exemption added to that. Special note here, you cannot receive 65 or over and a disabled person's exemption on the same property. You're going to have to choose one of those exemptions. Another benefit to the 65 or over and disabled persons exemptions is there are some portions of your tax bill that will freeze. And I'll talk a little bit about that also. So back to the budget and tax rate meetings. Um, there are some important things you need to know. Which taxing units levy a tax on your property? When do they adopt their budget and tax rates? And what are you willing to do without to have a lower tax bill? <clears throat> There's a portion on both the appraisal district's website and my website when you search for your property. There's a portion if you scroll down, there's a, um, a list of the taxing entities on your property. And on my website, and I believe both on the appraisal district's website as well, you can click on each one of those entities. So this is my house, and I have, I'm have i being taxed by the city of Brown Rock, Williamson County, Austin Community College, Williamson County Road and Bridge, that's, that's, that's the uh, Will, Williamson County FMRD uh, taxing jurisdiction there. The Round Rock ISD and Upper Brushy Creek Water Control and Improvement District. So I've got six taxing jurisdictions, and I can click on each one of those. It'll take you to that taxing jurisdiction's website. So come in August, when we publish those notices telling you when the tax rate hearings are going to be, they will, those notices will also be published on these entities' websites, and you'll be able to find out when their tax rate hearings are going to be so you can participate in this, pro in this process. I do want to give you real quick willco.org slash property tax or tax.willco.org. That's my office's website. Um, you'll see a lot of information there about your taxes that are due. The appraisal district's website is wcad.org. Williamson Central Appraisal District, and, um, and they've got more specific information about the, your house and, and how they valued it, the square footage and stuff like that. But both of those websites there, you can get to to find out which taxing jurisdictions are taxing your property. There's links there where you can go to their websites. Again, in starting in, uh, in August, we'll be posting the notices to their websites telling you when they're going to be having their uh, tax rate adoption hearings meet in meetings and then hopefully we get to talk a little bit more about that about the legislation that's that's been proposed that gives you some more information some more tools on how you can participate in this process i'd like for to introduce steve west former cfo for georgetown isd and he is going to talk about local property taxes for school districts and the state funding and how those two mesh and, and the impact each one of them has. Hopefully, is this loud enough? I don't think so. Okay, good. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, good. I hear, I see hands up. That's good. Uh, public education system in the state of Texas is funded 
uh, significantly by uh, low property taxes. Um, when I talk about state funding, I'm talking about not the debt service side, which I'll address a little bit separately in a minute, but more the maintenance operations, what it takes to pay teacher salaries, to operate buildings, to pay utilities, things like that. So that's what we call the maintenance to operation uh, piece. About 55% of funding at the state level, from the state budget level, uh, is funded through property taxes. So property taxes and state aid are married and form an anomaly when it comes to uh, calculating effective tax rates and rollback rates. Uh, school districts do not get 8% on top of an effective rate plus debt uh, to, to fund their, uh, their programs at the local level. Uh, they're subject to a uh, so slide I'll show you in just a second that shows uh, basically the interplay between state funding and local taxes. So not all the taxes that are collected in Georgetown stay in Georgetown, and you'll see that in just a minute. The slide is really difficult for you to read. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the letters are too small, but basically maintenance operation uh, side of the tax rate, which in Georgetown is $1.80. Uh, many districts would be at a four, which was the maximum the school district could adopt without voter approval. Georgetown had an election in 2012 that bumped the uh, amount of local taxes for maintenance operations to $1.08. So basically, it's used for utilities, salaries, supplies, uh, just general operations, which we probably consider your own household. Not the mortgage of your household, but just the operations of your household groceries, utilities, et cetera, like that. Um, it has limits, uh, limited to a dollar or a compressed rate, um, and it has a maximum of $1.17. As I said earlier, it down to $1.08. Uh, requires voter approval for a rate greater than $1.04, which you did in 2012 as a community here. The debt service side, on the other hand, is used for retirement long-term debt in principle. It's voter approved. It generally capped at 50 cents. Uh, Georgetown is not at 50 cents. It's a much lower rate than that, around 32 cents, I think. Um, it cannot be used for general population expenditures. I wanted you to have a picture of state aid and the interplay between state aid funding and local taxes. You, three, you see three containers here. Each container is uh, partially full to completely full. So one on the left side represents the dark section represents local taxes. In the middle, you have about half, it's about half full representing local taxes from the local community. And then you see on the right side, uh, the container is totally full and flowing over. So what does this represent? There's an inverse relationship between local property taxes for school districts and state aid. As one goes up, as local taxes go up, state aid goes down. So you see there's less to be filled in the middle cup uh, or container. Uh, so the state, when it pours its money in, fills it to the brim, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to replace any of the local taxes. Whereas in the other, the first lot, uh, container on the left, you have more state aid going into that particular uh, school district. Uh, so that you still have a roughly equal um, level of funding for each one of those school districts. It's just that the amount of money coming from state or local sources varies. So this is what's called the equalization system. Um, since about 1994, uh, when um, the, the courts ruled and the legislature passed legislation that required that state lo local funding be equalized, that is, tax effort for one district with very low property uh, values would generate the same amount of money per kid as a, a, a rich, more poor, uh, fluid uh, district in terms of property value per student. And property values per student does not represent wealth of a community. Wealth of a community is totally separate. Property values per student has to do with the number of students in a geographic area of a school district and the relative wealth that's associated. So a district that has very few students may have high mental wealth and thus have a very high um, uh, wealth per student, but the community may basically not get wealth at all. 
So wealth per student is not tied to the econ economic level of the people that live there, in other words. So there's an inverse relationship between state aid and local taxes. Uh, the state sets the amount of revenue or resources that school district can get. So regardless of what we collect in taxes, here in Georgetown or around our or any other school district in this county or this state, uh, there was going to be an uh, offset uh, in terms of state aid versus local taxes, as you can see in this, uh, these two examples. In the third example, you find what's happening in Georgetown and some other school districts in the state um, that are called recapture districts. Um, in 1994, there were 34 districts totaling $131 million of excess money that was collected above what the state allowed you to keep in the local school district. In 2018, it's gone to almost 200 school districts, and the total is not $131 million, but $2 billion. This, this excess money that's put into the state coffers that's used to fund public education and other things, but primarily public education. Um, so Georgetown finds itself in the last container, and property use um, or property taxes that are collected don't stay in Georgetown. All of those dollars don't stay in Georgetown. Um, so higher taxes do <coughs> not mean more spending by the local school district as evidenced by the, the size of the container. It stayed the same regardless of the school district. Uh, it just depends on how much money you get from each source of funding. And, uh, and so that gives you kind of an overview of what it looks like at a very high level or how education funds come from both state and local sources. So again, my name is Larry Gonzalez. Um, I am not elected anymore. Man, <laughs> what's amazing in a meeting like this is every single sentence that all three gentlemen have said tonight is so critically important. If you're trying to take notes, what you'll find is you can't keep up because all of it is important. Every sentence builds on the sentence before it, and all three pieces work together. This is the complexity and the difficulty of the system, which is why uh, wonderfully these guys have said, let's go talk about this a bit more. So I'll tell you this, I've, I've, I've got a few talking points, I'm probably better in the, in the, in the Q&A section uh, coming up if you have specific questions about the legislature right now. I am following it um, pretty closely, so let me tell you this. The number one issue in the state of Texas, as per every poll I've seen, is my property taxes are too high. I don't care where you live, I don't care how you vote, I'm telling you everything we've seen is my property taxes are too high. And they want the legislature to fix it. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces here. And what is the legislature's job to fix it versus what is the local entity's job to set their rates, right? So we struggle at the Capitol with a conversation about whose job is it. <coughs> if your tax is going up, there are some who think, well, that's responsible of the local entity. They're accountable to the election box. Make them, hold them accountable in the election. And that has predominantly been the conversation, which is take it up with your ISD, city council, commissioners court. They're the ones that are that that are uh, uh, adopting those rates. Comma. However, there is a big push from the legislature that they should uh, cap. Larry Gaddis talked about an eight percent rollback. The conversation of the capital has been: we want an automatic trigger, not an election. Right, eight percent qualifies you to go to an election to lower that number. The conversation now is an automatic trigger, where it goes to an automatic election where the voters will approve it. So, what's that number? Two years ago, the Senate said four percent. It's eight percent now. Two years ago, the Senate said four, and the House said six, and we never got to a number. 
And so it came to the next year. Well, it makes sense, right? If, if one's at four and one's at six, then clearly you start at two and a half. <coughs> Man, I'm not elected like anymore. So the conversation started at two and a half. That's a really little number. So I'll tell you what happened today. The Senate has adopted three and a half for cities, counties, special districts, and two and a half for your ISD. Okay? There's a little problem. So when the House passes a budget and the Senate passes a state budget, five from the House, five from the Senate get together, 10 men and women from across the state write the final $220 billion state budget. 10 people. Yeah, I was that guy twice. So I talk about the budget. Yeah, I know the budget. There's a line in the budget on funding education which assumes a certain rate of growth to pay for education. 6%, 4.7%. There's a number in there, year one, year two. So what do you do when you base a budget that pays our share of public education that assumes a certain number and then you pass a bill that's half of that number? Where's the delta? I don't know. I asked that question all day today. I asked that question all day today. Where's the delta? Who's paying the delta? Because you wrote a budget based on to pay for our fair, our fair share of public education with the assumption, with the assumption of 4.7, 6.0, whatever that number is. But the Senate bill now says 2.5 cap. That's interesting. So I don't know the dynamics of that uh, and, and, and what goes on there. Um, the Senate has Senate Bill 2, the House has House Bill 2, those are your property tax reform. Reform, not relief. Not relief, not it relief. Not it relief. relief. So the legislature got in a little bit of trouble over the years because they kept calling it tax relief, or they would say tax cuts. Nothing about this, what they're doing in Austin, nothing about this reduced cuts your taxes. Nothing. So I think when you get to social media or some elected officials really misuse the words when they talk about uh, the, the tax cuts or, or tax relief, because the truth is what they've really done is they've slowed the rate of growth in your tax bill. That's what they've really done, okay? So if your tax bill was going to go from 10 to 16 and only went from you know, 10 to 12, we go, well, you know, there's your there's your relief. Well, not really, because what the what the what the what the people see is my tax bill went up. And what the legislature says is, well, not as much as it could have. But I don't think that meets the demand of what the voters are saying. All right, jump here in here for a second here. Sure. So and, and I just want to comment on what these two guys have said. Steve, I think in 2006, the state was funding, for Georgetown ISD specifically, you told me 50% of your funding came from the state, 50% came from local property taxes. Last year, 37% came from the state, 63% yes. came from local property taxes. So that is how the state legislature has shifted the burden to local property owners, specifically on the school, uh, school taxes. And that is your biggest tax out of your entire tax bill. Anywhere between 50 to 65, 66% of your tax bill is for the school district. So this whole discussion about um, school funding is the only way really to lower taxes um, in a meaningful way because so much of it comes from the state and, and funds the biggest uh, consumer of our property tax, and that's the school district. The other piece I just want to point out, this guy over here, the state constitution says he has to value property at market value and um, use the sales of properties to help determine what that value is. But I'm gonna tie both hands behind your back and put a blindfold on you and you're not allowed to know what the sales are. You've gotta find a way to figure that out. And I think that's disingenuous. I think that, that, that particular part needs to change. 
in state law, but I do want to point out that you know HB3 is the school funding bill, and there's been articles written that say that um, on average it's going to lower or compress the tax rate approximately four cents for most school districts throughout the state. So Round Rock ISD, I've got a dollar four is my maintenance and operations rate for Round Rock ISD. It's going to go from a dollar four to a dollar. That four pennies on a three hundred thousand dollar home is going to save me ten dollars a month. Ten dollars a month. This is what property tax relief sounds like at the state legislature. And it's going to save me ten dollars a month, pumping six point four billion dollars into the school above and beyond what they're spending today. An additional $6.4 billion in school funding is gonna save me $10 a month. And if your property value goes up 4%, the next year, you've just erased that savings that you got. So, so Steve was right. So Steve talks about the percentage of each entity, right? So as your local share for your ISD goes up and up and up, what does it take down? The state has reduced its share. So it used to be in this 50-50 range, and actually it should be, I think, for, for like courts. Or, and so what happens now is, it got down to as low as 37%. So what they're looking at now is, in uh, Senate Bill 3, is they're getting back to about 40, uh, House Bill 3, they're getting back to about 43% is kind of where they're getting now. But that's a significant amount of cash from the state. Should they do it? Sure. But understand that if you don't have a whole lot of money, it's coming from someplace else. Now, we happen to be in a time in Texas right now, we have money. We have money to spend, and we're spending it. Comma, however, we won't always. We won't always. So when you start doing the math on increased public education, teacher pay raises, money, 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 and over here, reduce taxes, reduce taxes, reduce taxes, boy, at some point, you gotta start seeing those numbers add up. And it's gonna be tricky for the next two months to see how those numbers are, are uh, gonna get add up. Now, if you are Austin ISD, and Steve touched on this as well, Austin ISD, they are property rich, which means they get a whole bunch of money in taxes. But they are, I think the number, and I, I mean, it's gotta be over 7% free or reduced lunches. Property rich, but the people themselves don't have a lot of cash. And you know, the last I checked, Austin ISD, through the Robin Hood program, was sending $500 million Elsewhere. Yeah, Is it higher? Yeah, it's seven. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Now, that number's getting higher and higher for Round Rock, and around here, you're starting to see those, those, those numbers get out of kilter as well. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just amazing to me. So here's another piece of the puzzle, though, is that you've got House Bill 1 and Senate Bill 1 on the budget, and House Bill 2 and, and Senate Bill 2 are the property tax relief, and then you've got a reduction, whatever what it is now. Then you've got uh, House Bill 3, Senate Bill 3, which is education funding. It's really critical that all three of those work their way together. Together. If you don't get three and two right, then one's wonky, right? And so they have this balancing act right now where not only do one, two, and three, they're trying to make those work, they're trying to make them work in each body. Imagine when they do figure out one, two, and three in the House, they do figure out one, two, three in the Senate, and they're not the same. Therein lies your conference committee. That's when those guys start hammering out and figure out exactly what that looks like. It's, it, is, uh, it is complicated, and I'm so glad these guys have uh, put this together for us. Um, let me see what else are in my notes here. We, let's get started with some questions. Yeah, that's, people probably know one a lot more from questions than that. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of the q and A. I, I think there's so much more game because they were talking about that. Let me. Let me, let me throw out a couple of, because we know, because we know from the frequently asked questions, we know it's out there. I'm going to throw up a couple of them to get going, just to make sure that we touch the ones that we know are going to be asked. 
So, Alvin, does the Williamson County Appraisal District raise values as a result of requests from taxing entities? So I've been doing this for 10 years as chief appraiser in this county, and I can honestly say I've never had these. Can you hear me? It's green. It's supposed to be on. Better? Okay. All right. So I've been doing this job as chief appraiser in Williamson County for 10 years. I've never had a single city, school, county, any of them ask me to raise values. The reason values are being raised here in our county, we're one of the fastest growing counties in the state of Texas. We have an, an amount of demand in this county that is unreal. The number of people moving into this county versus the supply of homes being provided for those people do not equal. If you remember back in your economics classes, supply and demand factors have to equal for prices to make, maintain. What's happening is you have a huge amount of demand and not enough supply, so prices are going up. I said earlier, we measured 7,500 new homes in this county. It still wasn't enough. Until we see those things equal, until the builders build enough homes to meet the demand, you're going to continue to see raises in value. I don't raise them because I want to. I raise them because the sales are telling me to. And if I don't, as I mentioned in my presentation, our schools lose state funding. What Steve was talking about a while ago, we have even less of it. We get, we get no state funding or limited state funding if I do not put values where they should be. So keep in mind, I'm trying to do my job as outlined by the state legislature. When I raise values, guess what happens? I get to see more of you in the office. That is a huge disincentive. <laughs> I do not want to deal with more protests. It's unfortunate, but that's the case. Uh, so no, we do not raise values at the request of entities. I'm going to ask one for uh, Larry Gaddis. What if I forget to file my homestead exemption? Will I get a refund? So I believe the appraisal district, so that's a little wonky thing. You file your appraisal, your homestead exemptions, your over 65 disabled persons and other exemptions at the appraisal district. They let us know um, that you filed it because they've got to confirm ownership of the property and when you, uh, the date on which you had owned the property, they let us know that that homestead is on the property and then we recalculate your tax bill. So if you forget to file your homestead on your property and you've already paid those taxes, you guys can go back up to two years, I believe, depending on when you filed it. So we'll calculate back as many years back as we can and generate a refund of the taxes that you had already paid. So important about the exemption piece, go to, go to WCAD.org or my, my website, make sure your all the exemptions are on your property. So I'll, I'll add this to you. So we're gonna to go to Q&A here in a second. I have, I have a couple that were written down, but it's important to know these gentlemen do not have your specific information tonight. The database in here, they're not gonna look up and, and, and look at. We will, we'll take general questions, but general. after this, we do have staff here that can look up your particular property if you have a specific question about something that's going on on your property. For your taxes, we do not have our value database with us, so this is not the opportunity for you to protest your value. <laughs> so let me ask one of these questions that one of our uh, participants in the audience wrote in. Do you factor in data such as number of days on market for home sales within comparable price ranges, or do you just look at the home sales price? That's a great question. So we look at the actual sale prices that properties transact for. Uh, the number of days does not come into impact. And again, if we do not use those actual sale prices, the comptroller's office does, and they will be grading our values on those sales. So the number of days, while it may figure into what that end price is, the longer time it spends on the market, usually you start to come off your list price, which means that sale price may not be as high, but that ultimate sale price that happens is what we're gonna utilize for your valuations. Okay, we have a couple of live mics in the audience. <coughs> we got one over here, right there. Yes, my question is for Mr. Langford. Langford, yes. Langford, you had a chart up there Sure. 
So the the market data tab that I mentioned on the website a few minutes ago. So when you come into protest, you'll be able to see the market data tab. Not the market data tab. I mean, let me direct you on one thing. So the market data tab is that little red house icon. Once you look it up, that's going to take you to the map of the sales that are in your area. Which, if you click on, it will have that data you're looking at as far as the size and that sort of thing. But what you're talking about is the sales comparison grid, which is the adjustments. Is that correct? You no, showed a listing at the table of each house. That's the sales comparison grid. So quickly, I'll flip back to it so you can see. This one here? Okay, that is the sales comparison grid. That's what I was telling you about. So this is when you file a protest, this becomes available to you. It's not available right now in our state because Texas is a non-sales disclosure state, so we cannot publish those sales out there to you. But there is a provision in the state tax code that once that protest is filed, we can give you additional information. And that's where that comes from. That doesn't have like, you know, how many square feet and how many bedrooms will be it has it on there, but that, again, the, the sale price portion of this and the adjustments portion of this can, not only, uh, can only become available to you once you file that protest. But However, if you want to look up the details of those properties, what happens? When do I get that? You can actually request that at the time of the protest, but I would recommend that you actually file online if you feel like your market value, you've seen evidence out there that supports your market value that should be lower. File online, and that will actually be emailed to you. Um, um, we, got, we got one right here. Can you speak up? Yeah. I'll repeat it yeah. if necessary. So you talk about homestead and calves and, and all that and aggregates and, and that's pretty interesting. Um, but I have some, some non-homestead property and my assessment went up 38%. Seriously? So that's going to be, that's going to be based on the sales in your area. I agree, that seems like a very large increase, but I will tell you that the data that we have in your area would support that increase or we would not have, we would not have increased your value. So that's going to be a dramatic increase. How do I afford that? I can't answer that question for you, sir. Somebody want to bring a mic over to these individuals? Oh, I didn't see you over there, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's actually not a whole lot of their total revenue that the taxing jurisdictions get. Um, it, it is factored into when we hand over the revenue to the taxing units, they, it, it may be a small fraction of the, gen, the revenue that is generated for Georgetown ISD, the rollback stuff. You know, there's, you know, I've seen rollbacks of, Twenty, thirty, forty thousand um, dollars for for some properties, and as a whole, that's not a significant portion of the taxing unit's uh, budget. They look at what the trends are each year for for property tax revenue, and it may be a half of one percent for their total revenue uh, increases. So it, it it's not a factor when they're concerned. They don't look at that one specific. Revenue generator. Yeah, and it just seems like there's just a lot of property coming online that are now developing. That that yeah. seems like it would just be a huge one-time chunk that the tax is for this case. It, it's not that much. Let me let me mm -hmm. come in quickly. The rollback that she's referring to is not the same rollback rate that we were referring to in our slide presentation. This has to do with agricultural valuation. So when a property is under ag valuation, which is a much lower valuation, when it develops the property owner at that time pays taxes on the difference between that ag value and full market value for five years in arrear. 
And so there's a, a number attached to that. That's what she's referring to. So that value, that additional tax that is paid by those uh, individuals, is, she's wondering if that would have an impact on the overall budget for those taxing units. And as Larry mentioned, it's a very small amount you know, in, the, in the whole. We have another question over here. By the way, the, the legislature is looking at that. There is a bill to look at that five-year look back plus interest. There are at least a couple of bills that are looking at your exact issue, two or three years. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. some sort of lesser figure than what I've been talking about there, we would, we would do that. So really, that's the responsibility of the state legislator to make those changes. Uh, just to give you an idea, there are states in the United States that have what's called an assessment ratio. So basically, if a house would sell for 100% of market value, they have an assessment ratio that would say, well, you're only going to pay taxes on, say, 80% of what that is. So that is available to our state legislator to make those adjustments as well. But as long as the law is the way it is today, I have to do exactly what you just mentioned. Uh, I have no control over the market itself. I have to reflect what those sales are. So as long as those sales keep happening, I actually have to do that job that you just described. My, my question is, is on the sales comparison grid, when you bring in a um, sale that the county doesn't have, how does that get added to the grid, and how do the amounts that are in that grid, how are they determined? Is that via your software, or is that via the appraiser? Are you saying if you bring in an additional sale that we don't have? Correct. Okay, just want to make sure I understand your question. So what we'll look at is we'll look at how comparable that property is in comparison with the sales that we already have. If we feel there's an equal comparison, in other words, it's very similar in square footage, very similar in size, or excuse me, uh, quality, age, that sort of thing, we'll then insert it into that sales comparison grid. It'll make those same adjustments I mentioned before for any differences between it and your property, and then it'll refigure the total numbers associated with that value. Okay, so the, I don't know what it's called, the R rating that you That's put That's the quality on, level. The quality level that you put how is that determined, for instance? Sure. We uh, actually have a class in guide uh, that our appraisers utilize to use for identifying what quality level each property is. Okay. So there's a general guide that's out there that helps them identify is this an R4 or an R5 home. And it's based on the quality level of those homes. Ultimately, it is looking at that home in comparison with others of lesser quality or higher quality, setting a benchmark of those and then calling all those properties that look like that one the same quality level. So that R factor that you're talking about is the quality associated with that particular property. Okay, so in a brand new neighborhood, the sales comparisons are brand new homes compared to the older homes. 
and and the adjustment for the age is a thousand dollars. That doesn't make sense. Our property value has gone up over fifty percent in the two years that we've owned it. And you're in a brand new neighborhood, so very, very new homes is what you're saying. And you're saying that there are older homes or homes that were built when the, the neighborhood first created versus homes that are now selling in that area? Correct. So we, we use a common, the, I'm sorry. It's a new neighborhood. So the older homes are like five or six years old, the okay. brand new one, and the adjustment is $1,000. Right. We use a combination. Home. We use a combination of all those sales, any of the older homes that have sold as well as the newer homes to do your initial valuation. The adjustment that you're talking about is when that sales comparison grid is, is entered into the equation when you're looking at those adjustments between them, that it is $500 a year uh, for depreciation associated with older homes versus newer homes. And that's just based on the, the sales differences we're seeing in those properties. That's a county-wide figure. It can obviously be changed over time. We're actually studying that in uh, portions of the county now as a part of how much depreciation should be applied with older homes versus newer Okay, that doesn't make sense because our home is four years old and it's got a thousand dollar depreciation. I'd have to look at it. I, again, I don't have your property specific information, but I'll, we'll take a look at it. I gave you uh, the, the time frames to come in. If you'd like to come in and talk, talk to our appraisers about that, we can. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, when, if you choose to go down and uh, dispute or discuss your appraised value of your home, does the first time you walk in and talk to an individual appraiser, does he or she have a restriction or limit how much they're allowed to adjust your property? We're looking at the value that it should be on that property. If you're meeting with that appraiser and it goes beyond about 15%, then they will go to their manager to get approval for that. But there is no restriction on what that final value should be. Okay, and my next question is, if I, I know you talked about the sales and the comparisons. Do you, how about your own appraisal district versus for a house that's say two or three doors down from my house and what their appraised value is, and then you take my house, which is 25 foot difference, and it's almost a hundred thousand dollars more of an appraised value. Um, does that and the two the houses are very similar in age. The other person happens to have a pool and some nice things that I don't have, and the values are identical. Are the square footages very similar as well? 25. 25 square foot, I didn't mean there. So the only difference that I can think of without looking again at your right, property, I don't know that property specific, is there may be a quality difference that we have in our system that you're not seeing on the ground. That's something that you would want to discuss with that appraiser when you protest to be able to see why that particular home is different than yours. But again, and without looking at that myself, it'd be impossible for me to answer that at this time. Okay, thank you. There's one way in the back. Yes. Oh, we got one right here. Oh, I'm going to blame you. Uh, you spoke at length about the comptroller and statute and the party of the 100% uh, market value for residential properties. Yes, sir. Where is the same equity or accountability for uh, commercial and industrial properties? So that's an interesting question. Um, we mentioned earlier that sales compare our sales are not available on properties in our state as a whole. Uh, we are in a non sales disclosure state. You heard that said a couple times tonight. What that means is that in some states, Sales are published. You literally see them in the paper every Sunday. They'll list all the sales of homes and businesses and everything. They have 100%, those appraisal districts in those areas have 100% of the data that they need to be able to value those properties appropriately. To give you an idea of the percentages of what we get in the state of Texas, Larry mentioned having my hands tied behind my back at a blindfold. It's exactly that reason that we do is because in residential properties, we get approximately 80 to 90% of the sales. When you have a large sample size of sales for residential, we do a fairly good job of valuation on residential properties. However, on commercial, you have much less properties typically, but almost no sales are available out there for us to you know, obtain. And so we end up with about 20 to 30% of the sales on commercial properties. So what happens is you have an imbalance in between who is paying their fair share of taxes because of the sales disclosure, non-sales disclosure requirement we have in our state. Because until we can get a larger percentage of those sales on the commercial side, you'll continue to have the residential property owners paying more than their fair share. I think it is ridiculous in our state that we have that. I would completely agree with sales disclosure. It's been at the legislature every year that I've been involved and probably as many oh, sure. years as you, you've been involved there. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just not ever gained any traction. Got several. 
We have one up here, guys. Just one up here. They've got mics back there. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll get to you, sir. It's difficult. Can you put the... Can you hear me better? Yes, thank you. All right, about a year and a half ago, I bought a house at, and it was rated at 397000 So in 2008, last year, I healed it, and went down to 400000 So this year, of course, it went up to 40000 more in one year's time. But I did the online deal. I did get the Harrison sales report, but it actually increased it to another 17000 <laughs> And you mean the, the, the resulting sales comparison value was 17000 higher? We don't increase your value off that, but it was showing that the value should be $17,000 more. And one of the comps that they had, the very first comp, said the house was worth 457000 So when I looked at it, it was sold in November, last November, for only 405000 How could they say that house was worth 457000 when the comparable price was so there's a couple of reasons for that. One is not knowing what's inside that home. There could be some condition issues associated with that property that we are just not aware of. One of the other restrictions we're placed uh, on us at appraisal districts in our state is we can only see homes from the outside. I don't really want to go in your home. It's your private home, nor do I want anybody coming in mine. But that I haven't invited there, that is right. Uh, but in other states, they actually have access to come in and actually inspect the level or the condition of that home which we don't have that access. So there's probably some of that going on with that particular home. Uh, Chris Conley, the guy that just handed you the mic, just the other day we were looking at a property, uh, and this property, uh, we had value just like other ones in that neighborhood, but if you went in and looked inside that house, which we were able to find some, some pictures that were available online that we didn't have, the entire house was painted, painted a really ugly blue color. <laughs> and really dated appliances. We had no idea about any of that. So it's really impossible for us to have all the accurate information. So what I also suggest is if you have a particular home and your home has a problem that we can't identify because of that, let's say you have a crack slab, you have uh, a roof that's 30 years old, whatever that may be, bring in estimates to fix those items and then we can take those into consideration. I'm not going to know how much it takes to fix those issues, but you can bring in those estimates and we can, we can do that. But that home that you talked about being used as a comparable probably has something going on with it that we're just not familiar with. So uh, I would just say that all your comparables are sold for much less than what the value is. About forty to 50000 less. And that was all the comparables that you had. And were they, out of curiosity, were they very large square footage homes? Yeah, there are some areas that for some reason we call it a size bias. So there are some areas that very large square footage homes do not meet the sales in, in our model the way that we would intend them to. So there are large areas, our large homes that sometimes are slightly over appraised that we may need to adjust. So it may be that that property needs to be protested. We can bring it in and take a look at it. Right. So since I filed online, the first sale was May 1st. Can I still do a walk-in before May 1st? On your notice, there's going to be an, an actual uh, uh, date frame that you can come in. I don't have your notice, but if you'll look on there, uh, and the verbiage towards the bottom of the notice, it'll give you the date and time uh, that we allow that walk-in period for your particular property. How long period will it take? I'm sorry? How long of a period was it closed so, so we divide the, the county into thirds, basically, and we rotate what that third is you know, each year. And so a third of it will be a week and a half. The next third, it'll be two and a half weeks, and the following third, it'll be three and a half weeks because it's from the beginning of when you receive that notice till that final day. However, if it's one of those that you are not going to be able to make your hearing or, or you cannot have another available time, if you'll come in and speak with our staff, we'll give you some availability. And we're trying to use that because what was happening in years past when we just opened it up for everybody, nobody came in the first few weeks. And everybody waited till the last minute, and all of a sudden we had, you know, 45 minutes to an hour wait times of people all the way lined up out the door because there was no controlling the amount of flow and definitely no controlling people's procrastination. And so that's what was happening. So we tried to control that flow by kind of dividing it up a little bit. Mr. Gaddis, I wondering if you could explain what part of our taxes, those of us who are 65 and older, living here in Georgetown, what what you So, uh, I Thank you for asking me the question. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not the only one up here. Uh, 
Um, so when you turn 65 or if you have a 65 exemption or a disabled person's exemption, there are some portions of your taxes that freeze. Your value can fluctuate and your value will go up and down with the market. Your tax rates will change, so the tax rate on your tax bill will fluctuate with whatever the taxing units adopt each year. But what will, it's more of a ceiling. It's not a freeze, it's a ceiling. You will never pay more than what you're paying when you apply that exemption to your property when you turn 65 or, or submit your, your application for the exemption, uh, for the disabled person's exemption. There are three jurisdictions that are allowed to freeze their taxes for those two exemptions. Counties and County Road and Bridges and Williamson County Commissioner's Court, please thank them. They have, uh, many years ago, enacted the, the optional freeze for the county and the County Road and Bridge District. So your county and county road bridge taxes freeze. Uh, the city of Georgetown specifically freezes their taxes. That was an option that they had. And by state law, all school districts must freeze their taxes for over 65 and disabled persons. So if you live in Georgetown and you're over 65 or disabled person, your county, county road and bridge, Georgetown ISD and City of Georgetown taxes, and those are the four taxing units on your tax bill, your entire tax bill will freeze unless you do something like add a pool or do things like that, then we'll recalculate it. So they'll freeze in the year that that exemption is applied to your property. Um, school districts must freeze. Cities have the option, counties have the option, and junior colleges have the option. So ACC has the option to freeze their taxes uh, but they do not. They offer a huge exemption for over 65 and disabled persons, but they do not freeze. Uh, it is their option to do that. They chose not to, but in Williamson County, and I believe there are six or seven um, other cities that freeze. So City of Cedar Park, City of Gerald, Georgetown, can you pull out that slip? That's my, that's my code word, like pull out the slip and feed me some information over here. Uh, Gerald, Georgetown, Cedar Park, Liberty Hill, Leander, Leander Florence. Florence. So those are the cities that freeze. If you're in one of those cities, your, your ta city taxes will freeze. I'm sorry, I keep, I keep saying freeze. That's the ceiling, that's the maximum that they can go. If, you're, if the combination of your value and your tax rate equals a lower uh, tax than what you're paying in the year that you turn 65, you will pay the lower amount. But then if things change and it goes back up, you hit that ceiling, and then you pay no more than that. All right, so um, it is 7.47, we said 7.30. Mr. Gaddis spoke for 17 minutes longer than he was supposed to. <laughs> the little, little red card that she held up for like 15 minutes. I told but you she was not so, so that's how we kept going to, you know, Mr. Gaddis. So uh, there are the folks here to answer uh, specific questions like if you visit, they're going to be here to help you. And one more general question. One more. Question. I'm one more. Okay. I've never heard this addressed before, so maybe it's an easy answer. Um, when a builder buys land in plastic subdivision, they see that all the utilities get put in there. Say a subdivision is 20 years old. How come is the value going? of the property going up when the value of the utilities have been put in is going down because it's 20 years older. So the, what, the, what we have to do when you're valuing a piece of property, the first component you look at a piece of property is what the value of the land is. There are subdivisions out there, probably like the one you're mentioning right now, that haven't had a vacant lot in those subdivisions in years, right? They're completely built out. There is no additional land that we're getting sales transactions from. So what we do is we study the marketplace throughout the county and what and we determine the allocation amount. What that means is simply the amount percentage wise that is available to the improvement, in other words, the house, or the land. And it typically varies around or runs around 20%. So that allocation over time, it stays at 20%, but as value as a whole grows, so does that portion of the property, which is attributable to your land. So your land will go up over time, but the entire value, I can't buy your house without the land or the land without the house. They are one complete market unit. 
And so really it's that overall value that matters. It's what you pay taxes on and also what you can actually protest. I can't adjust your land down by $5,000 without an increase of $5,000 in your improvement value, your house value, if the overall value is correct. So the allocation, uh, no matter how much we put on your land, has to then go to the improvement in order so we hit that value as we were talking about that the state comptroller requires us to be at. All right, so I got, I got two things real quick. Number one, raise your hand if you learned something new here tonight that you've never heard of. And then I would like, number two, is for everyone to give these guys a round of applause. Uh, Yeah, we're we're going to stay here as long as we need to. If you have a specific question, please come up and ask, and, and we'll be glad to look at stuff. So, so you come over here.